So I want to invite you to turn with me to Romans chapter 2 as Pastor Josh continues uh, walking us through the book of Romans uh, in a series called Gospel Basics. We'll be reading verses 1 through 16 this morning. If you have a copy of God's Word with you, great, open that up. If you didn't bring one or don't own one, there's a one in the pew rack in front of you. Hope that you'll en- enjoy using that today. And if for some reason you don't own a Bible, we want to give that to you so that you can read God's Word daily and regularly make that a part of your spiritual walk. And so uh, there's a copy there for you. Would you uh, follow with me uh, reading verses 1 through 16 of Romans chapter 2? Therefore, you, are of no, you have no excuse, O man. Every one of you judges. Every one of you who judges. For in, uh, for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O man... You who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are stirring up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's judgment, God's righteous judgment, will be revealed." He will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek, for God shows no partiality. Verse 12, for all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law, for it is not by the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the, law of the, that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while they, their conscience also bears witness. And their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on the day when, according to the gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word again this morning. We thank you that it was written by men, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and is both timeless and true. And as we this morning seek to understand more of what Paul is writing to the church at Rome, Lord, may we not only hear it and understand it, but seek to live it out in these days, today and in the days ahead. Father, we thank you for the the pleasure it is to read your word and to hear it proclaimed. And so we do pray this morning that as uh, Pastor Josh opens your word, proclaims it, that you'd speak through him in his heart and in each of our hearts and in our ears and in our actions that follow from that as well. Father, we know that you are the righteous and good and just judge. You are the only one true God that's made heaven and earth, and we worship and adore you today. And we seek to follow you with all of our being. And so, Lord, as we hear now your word proclaimed, may we be hearers of it and doers as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jeff. It is fantastic to be here with you this morning. Y'all know that? Do y'all know that we get to do something as a, the, the church, the church of Jesus Christ gets to do something that very few people in this world get to do? We get to come together and collectively, at least once a week, right? More often than that, hopefully, we get to come together and we get to just stop. And as the outside world continues to swirl around us, we get to just stop and just focus on how good God is. So as we continue in God's Word today, I just want to encourage you. I know, uh, you know, you, you, you have stuff 
that you dropped off at the door when you got here, and it'll be there when you get out, all right? So just take a break, all right? Just take a break, and let's focus on the Lord together. Let's continue to worship Him, and let's seek to understand His, His Word, and maybe this way, once we go back out and, and catch up with all that stuff that's waiting for us, we'll be better prepared to deal with it, all right? So last week in Romans, what we saw from Paul is uh, we saw him really giving people the business, didn't we? He said everybody in this world, everybody who's ever ex been exposed to God's great creation has zero excuse uh, that they know deep within them, even if they deny it, they know that God must be real. And because of that, uh, God's righteousness is displayed in his wrath against those who disobey and pretend like they don't know who he is. And then we saw last week that God has given us wrath in part now, hopefully, right, for us here, that we would see that this wrath now in part would spare us the final end time wrath later. So now when we get in chapter 2, uh, we've got a group of people that are saying, oh, that was great for everybody else to hear. Right? The, Paul turns his attention to the Jewish people who say, we are God's people. We have God's word. It sure was nice for you to <laughs> admonish those people. We're good, right? And Paul turns back to them and he tells them the same thing that every single one of us need to know. And that is that we are all in the same boat. Right? When, we, when we're talking about God's righteousness, when we're talking about God's wrath and God's uh, current wrath poured out in part and God's judgment poured out one day finally, none of us, none of us are without excuse. Or none of us have an excuse. And God, we find out in today's passage, he shows no partiality. In other words, when he judges, he judges rightly. He judges with equity. Everybody on the same playing field. No favorites. God's not playing favorites with anybody. But we do. See, that's the problem. We do play favorites. When we try to judge, we get it wrong. I was reading some articles this week, and... Uh, so one survey said 75% of the participants admitted that in the last month they misjudged somebody. Another, art, another study, they took people and they put, uh, they put different faces in front of them. And these faces, they were dressed in different kinds of clothes, either rich clothes or poor clothes. They found out that even when they told the participants, pay no attention to their clothes, 83% of the people said they thought the ones with the rich clothes on were more uh, competent in what they do. Another study showed, and this is, this is you, this, I'm telling you stuff you already know, right? We know that we operate this way, but this was interesting. You will tend to trust somebody who resembles another person that you like. And you'll tend to distrust somebody who resembles somebody you don't like. So if, I, if, if you look like my best friend, I'm more likely to loan you five bucks to go get a sandwich. Right. And if you look like Hitler, I'm probably not giving you the five bucks. That's the way we work. And this is important. It's important to know that we, that, that we have these biases, as we, these biases as we judge people, because it affects what we do, right? It, it, it's it's going to have an effect on the people we spend time around, on where we go to work, how we work, it, it, on the people that we confide in or don't confide in. That's a big deal. But what God is saying here is there's something that's so much more important so much more important than how you make it along through this life, uh, and that is whether or not you stand justified or condemned before God Almighty. And he's saying, you guys are so bad at judging each other, don't even try this one. Don't even try it. I, you, this is, you should not be judging anybody. That's what he's telling us through this. Whether you're Jew, Gentile, slave, free, barbarian, Scythian, male, female, whoever you are, you don't need to be judging people. Now, before we get into this too deep, let me take a note here and remind us what Paul means when he's talking about judging. He's not saying we're never to correct anybody. He's not saying we're never to try to convince or plead with anybody or try to even warn people that they're heading down a bad path. What he's saying is nobody has a right to pronounce condemnation on someone. No human being has the right to be able to say to pass judgment on somebody else. All right. Now, kids, here's what you grasp from this sermon. All right? This is what you're looking for today. First of all, we're going to see why 
you don't have a right to, or we, we don't have a right to pass judgment on other people. We're going to see how we misunderstand God's judgment, and then we're going to see how we should rightly understand God's judgment. So why we don't have a right to judge, how we misunderstand God's judgment, and how we should rightly understand God's judgment. And then at the end, as kind of a bonus for us, we're going to see just how good this plays out when we believe it and live it. All right. So point one is this. Man has no right to pass judgment. Man has no right to pass judgment. Now notice here, <clears throat> as always, just kind of getting in the habit when you read Scripture, when you see a conjunction like therefore, gar in the Greek, it, it's connecting it to whatever came before it, right? So therefore, you have no excuse. Who is the you here? Now notice he's using no excuse. We've seen that before too, right? In chapter 1, verse 20, he said these people who are exposed to God's creation have no excuse. But now he's changing the audience. He says, you have no excuse. He's talking to the religious people of the day. So he's talking to the Jews and what these people think. Same thing that we think sometimes, right? We're God's people. We have, we have God's word. So whenever you're pronounced, you know, the, chapter one was for them. Chapter, chapter, look, chapter, this is not for us. Chapter one wasn't for us, right? Chapter one was for everybody that you invited to come this week that wouldn't come. But Paul's saying, nope, it's you too. It's even the people sitting in the pews. He's talking to these Jewish people there at the church in Rome. He says, yeah, you got God's word, but that does not excuse you. You're under the same, you have the same problem these other people have. And what he says the problem is, if you notice this, the problem is not that they judge, right? We say, well, if you're judgmental, that means that you're, you're sinning, right? The problem is not being judgmental because if it was only being judgmental, then guess what? God would be guilty of sin because God himself is the righteous judge. What's wrong with these people? What's wrong, what's wrong with you people? Not, not me. It's, y'all, it's always y'all. What's wrong with us? It's not that we judge. It's that we're guilty of the same thing that we're judging people of. You see that? He says, you who judge, you practice the very same things. In other words, the reason why we're not, we are, we are not competent to judge because we too are guilty. The same sin that you are so tempted to point at when, when you drive out on I-95 and when you get to work, when you get to your school, it's the same, it's the same sin you're guilty. You know the old adage, right? When you, when you point your finger at somebody, you got three pointing back at you. Jennifer told me that early on in our marriage. She let me in on that information. All right, so from now on, I'll do like this. <laughs> All right. There you go. But that's the, that's the point, right? That's, that's why we are, we are not competent to judge because we are steeped in our own sin. We, y'all remember the story of King David from 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12. Y'all know about, right, the notorious story about David. When he fell into this, this affair with Bathsheba and it ended up being just a terrible, murderous ordeal. And the prophet Nathan came to David and boldly told him. He, he said, I got, a, I got a good, hey Dave, come over here. I got a good story for you. He said, let me tell you about this rich guy I know. He's got all kinds of sheep. And he's friends with this poor guy that only has one sheep. And the poor guy loves that one sheep. He really cherishes that one sheep. But you know what that rich guy did? David said, no, what did he do? He said, that rich guy took that, took, walked over to that poor guy and took his sheep from him. David, what do you think should happen to that guy? That, that's the worst thing I ever heard. That guy deserves to die. And that's when the prophet Nathan said, well, that guy is you, brother. He says, you took Uriah the Hittite's wife from him. And, and the, the whole point, the whole, in, in the court, it's what it was used to illustrate to David his sinfulness, and it got David's attention, right? David repented. He realized how awful it is what he did. But it shows how quick we, right, we're quick to point out somebody else's issues and say, God, get this one. Get this one. And we don't realize as we call for God to punish sin in this world, we are calling God to punish us because we are guilty in sin. That makes us completely, uh, you know, we're, we're not competent to do that. Not only are we not competent to do it, we, when we deal, when we talk about the judgment of God, we have no quarter. 
We have no safety in God's judgment. So what we do is we don't refrain from pointing out sin. We don't refrain from pleading with people and, and really even, even using our powers of persuasion to help people understand, like the prophet Nathan did. Br- brother, this is dangerous. You are, in, you are in danger of the very wrath of God. We must do that for our friends and our families, and especially for the people of the house of God. Um, but what we don't do is, is, is hope that God just goes ahead and ends all unrighteousness right now. If I'm, if I'm riding somewhere with my wife and, and we're late, now bear in mind this is a completely hypothetical situation. First of all, I'm never late for anything. Second of all, y'all don't know this in the second service, but if you were in the first service, you'd know how funny that is. All right. <laughs> second of all, um, hypothetically, since we're late, my, maybe my foot got a little heavy and the car started going faster than that number that's on the sign that you drive by, right? The speed limit. So let's say we're doing this situation and Jennifer says to me, hey, sweetie, um, you know, you need to be, be careful because you may be speeding a little bit. That's completely and perfectly okay and right for her to do as my wife, right? That's okay for her to do. What's not okay for her to do is to call the cops on me. <laughs> you see, and, and it would be ridiculous. She would never do something like that for a few reasons, right? Many reasons she wouldn't do something like that. One of them being which, if I got in trouble, guess what? If I got a ticket, it's coming out of her bank account too. We share it together. If my insurance goes up, her insurance goes up. So that's the point. That's what Paul is saying here to these Jews. You think you're separate from all the other sinners of the world, but you are in the same exact boat of them. We have to understand this. The same exact boat. The people in chapter 2 are just as guilty as the people in chapter 1. The people in this room are just as guilty as the people that are not in this room. You know, when we look at wars in this world... Both sides of the war need the gospel. We all need it. And because of that, what we are not equipped, we have no right to pass judgment on other people. Remember, defining judgment as trying to proclaim God's condemnation on somebody, not correcting people. So why do we, we're tempted to do this. Why are we so tempted to do this? It's because we just we misunderstand God's judgment. Right? We misunderstand God's judgment. And this is what we do. All right. This this will help me out. This will help you out if you can kind of get this stenciled on your mind and try to live by it. And that is that we think God is impatient with others, and we think that He is infinitely patient with us. We think God is impatient with others, and he's infinitely uh, infinitely patient with us. So look at verse 3. Paul says, do you suppose, O man, and he says, same title he gave in verse 1 there, so he's talking to the same person, do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? So what he's saying, do you presume, do you presume that while, that, that God is just going to quickly judge these other people and that you're going to be fine? Right? Do, you, do you presume, do you think that God should be judging people right now? Do you think that you have the right to make that distinction? Right? You're, you are trying to sit on the judgment seat of God and decide when God must act with these other people. So, for example, we might be tempted to look at the people at Capitol Hill and say, well, surely we understand how God feels about them, right? God, we know, I know God is ready to judge those people, so God, I'm just going to go ahead and do what you would do anyway in my heart and my mind, because I'm just like you, I'm the judge. Right? We think that it's time, it's time, God, I've decided, it's time for them to be judged. You know those people that I was arguing with online this week, that have a different opinion of me? I've decided, God, it is time for them to be judged, so I'm going to let them know, right, with my fast fingers. Those, the bullies at my school, God, it's about time for them to be judged. So in my heart and my mind, I'm going to decide they're already condemned. The gossips in my neighborhood, the, the, the crazy uncle that's coming to Thanksgiving in a couple of weeks, you get the idea, right? We presume that God must be impatient with these people while at the same time we think that God is going to give us forever to deal with our own issues. Look at, look at what Paul says 
in verse 4. Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience? Yes, God is patient. He is patient. If you ever wonder if God is patient with you, just ask yourself this. Did I wake up today? All right. So yes, God is patient with you. He woke you up today. You're alive today. He gave you one more chance. One more chance. But he's saying, are you going to presume on this patience? Are you going to think that this patience lasts forever? I'm reminded of us. I think about this all the time. When I was in high school, I was was either a freshman or a sophomore. I really don't remember, and I'm sure as the older, I need to write this down because it's going to change. I'm going to be five years out of college by the time, you know, in 10 years from now, I'll tell the story. But I forget, all right? Freshman, sophomore, study hall. And I, I, I was kind of a new Christian. I've only been a Christian for a couple of years, so I was still very uh, in tune and, and thinking about the people around me and, and what it means to follow Jesus and how I can be a light to Jesus in this world. And I remember in my study hall, there was a guy on the other side of the room, and he was kind of known to be wild. And my, the town I grew up in wasn't real big. We pretty much knew everybody. And he was sitting on this side of the room, and they started talking about God for some reason. And... <clears throat> I remember what he said. He said, yeah, I know. I know that if I were to die right now, I, I wouldn't go to heaven to be with God. He, you know, I'd, I'd go to hell. He said, I know that right now. He said, but you know what? Probably when I get older, I have a family. Well, I'll probably start getting involved in church. Apparently he thought that, you know, that's what, that's what it meant to be a Christian was to be in church. That's what would save you. Of course, Christians... Being a saved Christian, belonging to Christ, means we, we definitely necessarily need to be a part of the church. Uh, but what saves us is faith in Christ. But anyway, his point was, when I get older, I'm going to figure all this out. Well, let me tell you what happened. Yeah, he got older. Yes, he did have a family. And I, I lost touch with him after high school. But I know this, somewhere around the age of 30, he died. He died. I don't know if he was right with God when he died. But I'll never forget him saying that in the study hall. And I'll never stop wondering, did he? Did he? Because I can guarantee you this. God's patience with him was not as long as he thought it was. He was thinking 70, 80 years. God thought 30. All right? And so Paul clarifies this patience in two ways. First of all, what is this patience? It's, it's uh, the God's kindness, still there in verse 4. God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. You know, that guy had another 15 years, you know, 14, 13 years or so to, to repent. And hopefully he did. Hopefully he took care of God's uh, patience. And that's the message for us. We have to remember the reason why God has not <laughs> cut your cord yet. It's because he wants to give you one more chance. And so if you're in here, if you're watching this online and you don't belong to Christ or you're still dead in your sins, understand, you are not allowed to presume on God's patience. You are not allowed to believe that he's going to give you an infinite number of chances to turn and believe in him. All you know right now is that he's given you one more chance. Today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow is not promised to you. And for the people who don't, this is what you're doing. For the people who don't turn and repent for your sins by God's patience that that he's been giving you, this is what happens. Verse 5. But because of your hard and impenitent heart, that's unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. So Paul's saying the fact, that, the fact that God hasn't returned today, the fact that Christ hasn't returned to claim his church today, one, it gives you another chance to repent. But if you'll not repent, what it does is it gives you another chance to just write one more line on your list, your testimony for why you belong in hell. That one more chance you gave me to trust in you, I wasted that one too. In Revelation 20, it talks about a book of life, and in this book of life are written every one of our deeds, and it's, it's the deeds by which God judges man. 
And he's saying, you're just proving your case against yourself. That's all you're doing. So we misunderstand that. We misunderstand that about God. Let me share this with you. 2 Peter 3, verse 9, Peter says this, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish. And I can't stress this enough. We talk about this all the time. There are people who grew up in this church or grew up in some other church. But you've yet to, to submit to God. And there's people who have heard of God in this world that are hearing this now and you've yet to submit to Him. And there's people that maybe this is the very first time you've ever heard this. And this is your opportunity. I want you to know that God does not want you to perish. That's why He's giving you this word of warning. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done in it will be exposed. All your works exposed. So we, now we need to understand how exactly does God judge. Right? So in reality, what God does is he judges with equity. What does equity mean? Simply put, uh, it means he gets it right. It means whatever his judgment is, it is completely correct, without error at all. Even Granny... Granny was so nice. She loved everybody. She used to tell me bedtime stories. She made me brownies. She came to every one of my soccer games. She loved me. She didn't love the Lord. So whoever God chooses to judge, whoever God judges, it's right. Here's why. So we're going to read verses 6 through 16. I'm just going to kind of give you a running commentary to help understand this. He will render to each one according to his works. You say, wait a minute, we're Baptists. We don't believe in that. We don't believe that God judges according to our works. We're not a works-based salvation. Hang in here, okay? There is more to it than this. But at least what we understand from this is that what you do actually does matter. Okay, and then we have like a chiasm here. It's kind of an ABA format. So verses seven through eleven, and what it does is verses seven and ten fit together. Verses eight and nine fit together. So first of all, there are those people who seek God. All right. So there's two kinds of people here. There are the people who seek God, and there's the people who seek self. So in verse seven, we see those who by patience and well doing seek for glory and honor and immortality. He will give eternal life. And then it matches up with verse 10. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first, and also the Greek. And then there are those who seek self, verses 8 and 9. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Why does he say Jew first and then Greek? Because salvation first came to the Jews. The law first came to the Jews. God first exposed, showed himself to the Jews. And the Jews were meant to take the truth of God and send it on to the nations. And once that truth has been sent to the nations through Jesus Christ, now there is no distinction. It is Jew and Greek that are in the same boat. What this means is when it comes down to God's judgment, there are only two kinds of people. There are those who will be spared God's judgment and those who are going to be destroyed in God's judgment. See, now we're not talking about, like with last week, we talked about God's wrath being poured out in part. Now we're talking about God's end-time wrath being poured out fully. And there are only two kinds of people in this world, the people who seek God and the people who seek themselves, and that's it. In verse 11, God shows no partiality. He knows exactly who is who. 
regardless of what time period you grew up in, regardless of what place in this world you grew up in, regardless of the people you grew up around or the school you went to or the job you had or the neighborhood you were in, God shows no partiality. He knows exactly which ones seek him and which ones don't. And there's a determining characteristic in this. All right, we'll get to it in just a second. Verse 12, it says, For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and those who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. In other words, those people who have the words of God and don't do it are going to be judged. Those people who don't have the words of God are also going to be judged. He's saying, you had the law and you ignored the law, so you're going to be judged. And you didn't have the law, and somehow you still managed to sin, sin against me. You're going to be judged too. Then in verse 13, for it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. This is like we see in James, all right? So what we're getting at here is we're starting to get to the point, how does God know? How does he determine which one is which? James tells us, I will show you my faith by my works. In other words, if you are the kind of person that belongs to God through Jesus Christ, then your works will necessarily follow. You will necessarily have faith parts of your life that are undeniably Christian. Now, verses 14 and 15, uh, these are a little difficult to explain, and there's not complete consensus on exactly what these, these verses mean, but I think we can get down to the, the main point, the main meaning. So verse 14, for when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. So what Paul is saying here, Gentile Christians, Gentiles who belong to Christ, they are judged by their heart. And it's evidenced by their work. What's in their heart displays itself in their work. And then he says these Gentile non-Christians are also judged by their heart, and it is evidenced in their work. And their work is a flashing sign that shows they don't actually belong to Jesus. They are accused by their own consciences. Now, here is where it gets tough, and here's where it gets tough for me and you. Because you're saying, okay, God judges by our works, and he knows our works are good or bad by what's in our heart. And this is why this is tricky. Because Jeremiah 17, verse 9, tells us that nobody knows the heart of man. That our hearts are desperately wicked. And so what this means is that the reason why you can't look at another person and judge another person is because you can't see that person's heart. And that's all right, right? We're good with that for other people. What's tough is this. You can't look at your own works and judge your own heart either because your heart is desperately wicked. Jeremiah 17, verse 10 tells us the answer to that. It says, but God knows the heart. God knows the heart. Remember, going back to that again, that's why we can't judge because we don't know the heart perfectly, but why God can judge because he does know what's at the base core of why you are doing what you are doing. Is it because you are seeking after God or is it because you're seeking after yourself? He knows. Even if you lie to yourself, he knows. Even if you put on the rich people clothes, he knows. Amen. Right? You might have the brightest and best smile in all of Woodbridge. But God knows if it's hiding something evil in your heart. So the question for all of us is what kind of heart do we have and how do we make sure we have the right heart? All right? This is where we get the answer. Verse 16, on that day, when according to my gospel, Paul says my gospel, when he says my gospel, he's saying the gospel that he's proclaiming, which we saw in chapter 1, is the gospel of God, which is the good news of Jesus Christ that he came to save sinners from death. All right? God judges the secrets of men, those secret things in your heart, by Christ Jesus. 
In other words, the determining factor, if your goods, uh, I mean, sorry, if your deeds line up as good or if they don't line up as evil, it depends on whether or not Christ has changed your heart. We go back to verse 15. It says that the work of law is written on their hearts. And this kind of gives us a hyperlink where we can fast forward to a book called Hebrews in chapter 10 where it talks about what God has done with this law. This is why there is no distinction anymore between Jew and Gentile because God gave the law to the Jews. And Jeremiah 33 says it's going to come a day when I take that law written on tablets of stone and I'm going to write it on hearts of flesh. And Hebrews chapter 10 explains to us how that happens. Verse 15, And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us, for after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put, after those days, after the days of the old covenant, right? In the new covenant of Christ, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. And then he adds, And this concerns me and you. All right. I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Verse 18. While there is forgiveness of thee, there, these, there is no longer any offering for sin. In other words, if you belong to Christ. Now y'all listen to me on this, okay? Because this is the good news. This is the, this is the extra scene after the credits. All right? If you belong to Christ, what has happened to you is that God's judgment has peered into your life. He has seen the sacrifice of Christ that you believe. He has seen the resurrection of Christ and his victory over the dead and over sin. And he has seen that once you believe this, the Holy Spirit has reached into your body, right? Metaphorically has taken out your heart of stone and put it in you a heart of flesh. And on that heart of flesh are written the very laws of God. You belong to Him, period, forever, to the end of days. Amen. 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 Now, there's more to it. There's more to this. All right? I told you, when, you know, uh, <laughs> sorry. I had, a, I had a great uncle. He used to tell me, he was, he was from Mississippi, right? He said, Josh, said, you're going to come to Mississippi. I'll treat you so many different ways. You're going to have to like one of them. All right? That's what we're doing right now. All right? I'm going to tell you all these different good ways that if you belong to Christ, you're going to have to like one of these, okay? In the book of Hebrews, so those of us that have the heart of stone replaced with the heart of flesh, we belong to Christ. We are now judged not by our deeds, but judged by Christ who did the deeds for us. And this is what happens. First of all, in verse 19, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. You know what this means? This means that though God is the terrible and awful judge of all the universe, because that judgment has already been satisfied, you do not need to fear. You can, you can call, call, sorry, crawl up into the lap of God. I hate to use the granddaddy God uh, kind of deal here, right? But, but that's what we're talking. You can approach him as if he is your good and kind grandfather. You can, come, you can come with boldness to the throne of grace. You can be right there next to God Almighty. You do not have to fear God. In your night watch, when you wake up sweating about that thing that you did when you were 22. All right? If you have accepted and believe in Jesus Christ and He is your Savior, guess what? Paid in full. You don't have to fear God. You do not have to fear God. All right. So I hope you like that way. If you didn't like that one, I got another one for you. Because God is the good and righteous judge, it also means that you don't have to fear anybody else. All right? Let me tell you something. You step in the ring with Mike Tyson in 1989 without having to be afraid that he's going to knock you out, 
You don't have to be afraid of anybody ever knocking you out. Okay? And the righteous judge of all the universe, you have stood in his courtroom, and he has pronounced you innocent. That means you don't have to worry about the judgment of any other person in your life. That means when you walk into a classroom, young people, when you walk into a classroom and you hear people talking terrible about your God, you don't have to be afraid to say the truth to them. You have already survived the great judgment of the cosmos. You don't have to worry about the judgment of a 15-year-old. All right? Grown-ups, when you go to your work, it works the same way. And a lot of times, kids, I want you to understand something, okay? I'm going to tell you, but I want, you, I want your parents to listen to this and your grandparents. Peer pressure does not stop when you graduate from high school. And I've seen this happen plenty among senior adults who have peer pressure among themselves. Senior adults, you don't have to be afraid of those people and their judgment either. You don't have to worry about anybody. And this it gets even better, all right? Here's another one. You don't have to be worried, worried about the judgment of church people. In light of everything that Paul just told us, he says, Then let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works and not neglect to meet together as the habit of some. Right? You don't have to worry, oh, my past is so bad. Oh, it's so terrible. Oh, they're going to look at me. Oh, they're going to point at me. You know what? I'm going to go ahead and tell you. Church is full of messy people. Somebody is going to point at you. But so what? God's not pointing at you anymore. You understand this? This is good news. This is good news for those of us who belong to Christ. Great boldness. It's what causes somebody like the Apostle Paul to be able to stand before the emperor of Rome, the high court of the day, the superpower of the world, and look at this man and say, you, sir, are a sinner, and you need to be saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's not a king in the land that you should be afraid to stand before and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ because you are right in the eyes of the King. And then for those who don't belong to Jesus Christ, who continue to presume on His patience and think they have another day, Paul says this, sorry, the author of Hebrews says this in verse 26, if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside, uh, who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine. I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Two kinds of people. Seeking God or seeking self. Seek God. Be justified in his eyes in the name of Jesus Christ. Seek self and be condemned. Let's pray. Lord, please help us rightly grasp the word uh, that we've seen. God, thank you for giving this to us. Thank you for not leaving us to think that we can just point the finger across the fence. Lord, uh, that that it's all these other people that need to hear this gospel. No, it is us. Lord, it is us for those who, who think that we can abide in our sin and test you in your patience. And it's for us who know the depth of our depravity. But we need the encouragement to know that we need not fear you and we need not fear man, God. And then for all of us who belong to you, that it gives us the freedom to be able to go forth and beg and encourage and plead and try to persuade and even try to warn others, knowing that we are not judging them, but we're just helping them to see the truth of you who does judge. Lord, let us take this truth with us and be encouraged today. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.